uh, my cousin Rosalind, um, she was one of those little Welsh ladies. She was about five foot nothing. And um, she was quite a character. And you would often lose her to view in a crowded room or a crowded space. You, you know, you quite easily lose her. But when she spoke, you knew she was present because she had one of those loud voices that was about 10 times the size of her stature. So her voice was an unmistakable sign that pointed to her presence there. You always knew when Rosalind was in the room because the sign was her voice. And that's how the healing miracles work in the New Testament. They are signs that point to the presence of God. And so, for example, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 23, we are told that Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. You remember Jesus started his ministry by saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. How do we know the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Yes, there is the preaching, but also that is followed by the signs. And one of those signs of his presence was the healing touch of God. But there are other signs that point us towards God's presence. One sign is a changed life. You take the story, for example, of Zacchaeus. I'm sure you're familiar with it. He was a notorious tax collector. He was rich. He was greedy. And he was universally hated. And one day he heard that Jesus was in town. And so out of curiosity, he went along to see him. But because he was small of stature, probably not much bigger than my cousin Rosalind, then he couldn't see above the heads of the crowd. And of course, they hated him so much, they weren't going to make any room for him. So what did he do? He hitched up his skirts and he climbed a sycamore tree in order to see Jesus. And so you can imagine the surprise that Jesus went past. He looked up and he said to him, Tim Zacchaeus, I must eat in your house today. I bet he fell up the tree. And the next thing we hear is that Jesus goes in with Zacchaeus to his house and not long afterwards, Zacchaeus emerges and declares to everyone that he's giving away half of his wealth to the poor and paying by four times what he defrauded from them. In other words, he had met with Jesus and he was a changed man. He was no longer rich and greedy and universally, well, he may still be universally hated. People hold grudges a long time, don't they? But certainly he was not rich and greedy. He had completely changed. And there are still many examples uh, of such changed lives today. Uh, some perhaps more spectacular than others. We all like to hear the story or the testimony of somebody who says, I once was a drug addict or a murderer or a gang member and I found Christ. There are great stories to hear, but not everyone is as spectacular as that. When I uh, met Jesus myself many years ago now, I'd actually been on that morning reading a book about Jesus, just coming to the part where it tells you in the book what he had done on the cross for me. And as I went and I started shaving in front of the mirror, ready to go for work, then suddenly as I was thinking about this, what they said about Jesus, the penny dropped. It was just, you know, I remember John Newton saying, my, my, I once was blind, but now I see. It was like that, as if suddenly the veil that uh, had hidden Jesus from view was parted, and I could see that Jesus didn't just die for the sins of the world, which is great news, isn't it? But he died for me. And when you realise that Jesus has died for you, that he went through all that for you, if that really, really sinks home, it has an incredible effect. And that really changed my life. There were no obvious changes straight away. I told my wife, and uh, so she knew something had happened. But I hadn't told anybody else. I went along to see my mother. We were living in Clidach at the time. And immediately I came through the door, my mother knew that something had changed. Do you know what mothers are like? They see things that nobody else sees, don't they? She said, have you changed your hairstyle? Have you got a a new jacket or something? What's what's going on here? So she could see. But nobody else could. Until later it became rather obvious. I left social services that I worked for at the time. We sold our house and I went into the ministry. In fact, out of the group of five friends that met for Bible study, three of us went on to be ordained. Three of us were changed. As we, uh, well, all, all five were changed because they, we were married to the other two. Um, so all five of us, three of us, sorry, went in for the ministry. God had changed 
met with us and changed us. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here today. So that's when, uh, one sign is to change lives. Another sign is, of God's presence, of course, is miracles. And miracle, a miracle is something that God does which is out of the ordinary. And, of course, the New Testament is replete with miracles. One of the most famous is the feeding of the 5,000. It's so famous, it's the only miracle that's in all four Gospels. And you know the story that Jesus took five loaves and two fish. After blessing them, he asked the 12 disciples to, to hand them out, and they do, and they feed the whole of the 5,000 on those, those the five loaves and two fish. And not only that, there were 12 basketfuls left over, we're told. There was no mistaking that God was present that day, because that's what the sign did. It pointed towards him. And you find miracles like these still happen today. I think in our congregations, we don't see a lot of it. But in the places where faith is still alive and the church is still active, you still see these things happening. One of the best documented took place in a shanty town in South, in the South American city of El Paso. We're talking back in the late 70s now. And um, Father Rick Thomas, who was a Roman Catholic priest, and his church have been reading a passage from Luke's Gospel, which tells us, where Jesus tells his disciples that when they have a feast, they're not just to invite the rich and the wealthy, but also the poor. And of course, in El Paso, there was lots of poor around. And the poor would gather at the local city rubbish dump. And there they would go amongst all the stuff and try to pick out things that could be recycled or sold on or, or whatever. And so that's where the poor was. So they were going to go and they were going to take a, a nice Christmas meal to the poor and so on the Christmas morning they went along they estimated there would be perhaps 125 well, people maybe less than that but they'd over allow it so they, 125 people there and so they prepared 125 burritos a few pieces of ham and some oranges and apples but when they went along they found out that they had massively underestimated and they were in excess of 350 people there so what were they going to do? Well, they said, well, what do we do what Jesus did? And so they prayed, asked God to bless the food and started giving out. And to their amazement, not only did they feed the 350 plus people, but they had so much left over that they took the rest and distributed it to the local orphanages. The miracle of God in El Paso. And if you want to see that miracle or hear about the documentation, if you're into YouTubing, then put in Viva Christos Rey and you'll find interviews with Father Thomas and some of the people who were there. In other words, it's an attested miracle. It happens today. God changes lives. I bet the bet is church is full that Sunday. And so change lives and miracles are both signs of God's presence. They were then, they are today because it's the same God. He hasn't gone away. And so, of course, is healing. And now reading this morning, Jesus has just finished preaching the Sermon on the Mount. He said he'd come down the mountain and he can't as a man there with leprosy. Now, leprosy was a common disease in those days. And the word covers a whole range of different kinds of skin diseases, from discoloration and psoriasis at one end to the one that we are perhaps more familiar with, where the limbs rot and fall off and the person eventually succumbs. And this, the worst kind, is known as elephantiasis great corum by the Greeks. It's called elephantiasis because when this person suffers from it, their face swells out to elephantine proportions, if you like, because that's such is the nature of the disease. So they call it elephantiasis great corum. And that's what was... This man was suffering for it. He had no new cure, no new cure, no cure. And people who suffered from it were permanently isolated from their family and friends and the local community. They were forced to live in a leper colony and they subsisted on the charity of perhaps friends or family who could not go near them but would leave the food at a distance so they could help themselves. And so the suffering was tremendous, not just the disease itself, but the sense of isolation sense of being cut off from everybody and it's likely that this man had that disease because in desperation he 
broke the law. The law of Moses said you should not go anywhere until you've seen a priest and he would give you the okay to go back into society. He broke all that. He was desperate. And so he came to Jesus and threw himself on his mercy. And there's a certain pathos, isn't it? In the way that he asked Jesus, he says, Lord, if you're willing, he's desperate. If you are willing, then you can cleanse me. And it's never easy to ask the help of others, isn't it? It takes a great deal of humility to throw yourself at the mercy of somebody and acknowledge your need. But when you are nowhere else to go, the choice is made a little easier, isn't it? And it's either that or a slow, agonising death. And he knew that, so he went to Jesus, the only person that he had heard could, uh, has had been performed miracles, but was, was Jesus willing to help him, a leper, an outcast, somebody that was excluded from society? And Matthew tells us Jesus didn't say anything, first of all. He just reached out his hand, he touched him, and he said, I am willing. Be clean. And Jesus did what was actually unthinkable in those days. He touched the man. Not only was the man unclean, but he could catch the disease himself. And the thing is, it's interesting, he touched him first. It's a kind of reassuring thing. And you know, touch is so important. It's very important in the Bible, certainly, because touch figures very highly. Remember the woman with the hemorrhage? She wouldn't even go near Jesus. She just thought, if I just touch the hem of his garment. So she reached out to him in the crowd. And Jesus sends his virtue, power gone from him, and she is healed instantly. And Jesus commands his disciples that when they are to go out, they are to lay hands on people and pray for their healing. So we know that touch creates a, a kind of a bond. It reaches out across all kinds of distances, pre- all kinds of prejudice, all kinds of racial divides, all kinds of things. Touch it's a wonderful healing thing in itself. I remember visiting a, a, a woman who was in an isolation ward in hospital. Couldn't see anybody. Couldn't, couldn't get any, near anybody, really. I mean, people obviously saw her. But far worse was the, uh, than her illness was the fact she could not hold her husband's hand because nobody was allowed near her. And this magnified her suffering. Just imagine the touch would have been such an reassuring thing to her. Well, Jesus reached out his hand. He touched the man, crossing that distance caused by the condition. And the effect was immediate. And the leper, we're told, was healed, cleansed. And to ensure that he was reintegrated into the society, again, he says to them, go and tell the priest. He will verify your healing. And not only will he verify your healing, but he'll be a witness to him. In other words, he will say to you, where or who has healed you? And the man can tell him. The witness. Well, I've said this, but what can we learn from this then? Because that's the important thing. That was then, we say, well, that was wonderful then. What about today? Well, you know, we just, resur- we just oh, we're still celebrating the season of Easter, the resurrection of Jesus. If we truly believe, this is the test of our faith, isn't it, really? If we truly believe that Jesus is risen from the dead to die no more, then we should have no problems in believing that the same risen Jesus appears, manifests, shows himself today, healing diseases. Not everyone, of course. The kingdom of God hasn't come in its fullness yet, but healing diseases, performing miracles, changing lives. And the thing is, see, what we read after the, after the Gospels, we hear the life of Jesus, Jesus ascends to heaven, he tells them to go to Jerusalem, wait for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes. What happens afterwards? The disciples carry on what Jesus had taught them to do and what he'd done himself. And so Acts 3, the disciples are passing by the beautiful gate. There's a cripple there. He asks for, for, for arms. And what does Peter say? Silver and gold I do not have. But what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, walk. And with that, they help him up. And Luke tells us, that his ankles became strong and he jumped to his feet and he walked. You see, they had invoked the one who was present and that is Jesus. He was present in them through, through the Holy Spirit but by his resurrection and so they could say the same thing, be healed in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. I believe in miracles still. I believe in healing and I believe in changed lives. The question is, do, do we? And do we live like that, as if we believe? Because that's the thing. It's not just saying it, living it. And secondly, although many churches and chapels are closing today, 
Uh, this is not universal. I, it's very hard to believe, isn't it, really? In my own diocese, uh, the chap the churches are closing at a phenomenal rate, or at least they are, they are running out of money and running out of people. So it, it seems to be universal when we look at our own denominations, but some within my denomination, I'm sure with yours, some are still are going. And if you go and look closely at these congregations and look at the heart of what's happening there, I'm sure you will find present miracles or healings or changed lives. Maybe all three, but certainly you will find changed lives, if not the other two. In other words, because God lives and they believe he lives, then they live. According to your faith, let it be done for you, according to your faith. And this idea of living because God lives is powerfully um, illustrated in John chapter 15, where Jesus uses the illustration of the vine and the branches, where the vine represents God the Father, and the various branches are the believers. And he says that as long as a branch stays attached to the vine, then the the life of the vine will flow into the branches and the branch will bear much fruit. But once a branch becomes detached from the vine, well, it will die because there's no more life flowing into it. Now, in my own denomination, I say there are many branches, many branches that have become detached from the vine through all sorts of reasons. Unbelief, I don't know, a growth of atheism, I don't know. The society in which we live in seems to seep into the church, doesn't it? I, 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 and the result is, of course, falling numbers and so on. I remember when I first joined the Diocese of Swansea and Brecon, Church of Wales has about six dioceses, and Swansea and Brecon just one, which goes all the way from the north, um, Flandre and Wells, all the way down to the south. And when I first joined, uh, 34 years ago now, or so, there were over 100 clergy. Now there are less than 47. You see, once a branch becomes detached, from the vine, it withers and dies. And that's what's happening. We have become detached from Jesus. We stop believing in these things and the capabilities that Jesus can perform amongst us. But you know, the vine never dies. God the Father is always and everywhere present. And so what we have to do as branches is make sure that if we are detached, to be attached again, grafted on, if you like, and once we do the life will begin flowing again. But lastly then, the question is, how can our churches and our chapels live again? How can we become reattached to the vine? Let me just end with this little account. In November 1949, two old women, one of them 84 years of age, not, not old nowadays, perhaps our average age in St. Peter's is about 90, I think, uh, one of them was 84 years old and the other was 82. One of them was completely blind. And these two faithful elderly ladies were greatly burdened because of the appalling state of their parish. Not a single young person attended public worship. And not a single young man or young woman ever went to the church. And does that sound familiar? Well, what these two women did, they were so greatly concerned, they were determined to go to God and talk to it. I always remember Billy Sunday, the great evangelist, whenever he had something on his mind or he couldn't answer something, he said, I'll go and, I'll go and talk to Father about it. Go and talk to Father. That's what they did. They go and talk to Father about it. As the old hymn says, which you, we've just sang, what a friend we have in Jesus. Do we? All our sins and griefs to bear, what a privilege and a responsibility, I have to add. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. That's what they took to heart. They didn't just sing the hymn. They believed it. Well, these two old ladies did, and things began to happen. The example inspired the church, which decided to gather for prayer on a regular basis. And for two months, they prayed regularly. And what happened next was told by one of the preachers that helped the stir or to perpetuate the revival was a man called Duncan Campbell and he says this in his book he says the power of God swept into the parish an awareness of God gripped the community such as hadn't been known for over 100 years on the following day the looms were silent 
Little work was done with, on the farms as men and women gave themselves to thinking on eternal things or were gripped by eternal realities. And I would want to say that it's the same God. 1949 in the Hebrides, the same God then as now. You go back to the New Testament, the same God then as now. We talk about the lives of John Newton and William Wilder before, some of the great saints of the Spurgeons and all the great preachers of God, same God. All the way through history, the same God. Why would he stop now? Why would God suddenly pack up and leave? He's still here. He's still present with us. The Jesus risen from the dead has been let loose into the world. And the same power is available to us today. But the question is, will we avail ourselves of it? I've always had this kind of thing. I've always had this thing that when I get to the end of my life, I don't want to look back and wish I had prayed more. I don't want to have those kind of regrets. I don't want to feel that I haven't been of use to God. I haven't served him in the way I should. I haven't done all I could. The question is, will we avail ourselves of this, this access to God through prayer? Will we, like the leper, throw ourselves at his feet and worship him and cry out for the healing of our churches and of our fellowships? Will we throw caution to the wind and tap in once again to the vine and bring life? It can be done. It has been done. And it must be done if the church is to live once again in the land. And our relatives and our friends and our neighbours and our communities, they need to hear of the saving death and resurrection of Jesus. They need to hear it. They're dying in sin, far away from God. And that is a tragedy. But we have the power, or the access to the power. We have it. We have the secret. They don't. They don't have a clue. But we do. But have we lost? Have we lost our access to God? It's still, he's still there. The question is, are we?